Well, welcome to the latest Haiku P podcast. It's episode 13 of the second series, and it's hosted by me, Patricia. My goodness, it's hot. Before I came up to the studio to record this, I had a quick look at the thermometer on the patio, and it's already showing 30 degrees. It's not even 10 a.m. yet. If you're coming across this podcast in the future, here in Europe, just at the moment, some of us are having a bit of a heat wave. Ours is due to break tonight, if my app is right, with a humongous storm. Can't complain, though. The beautiful weather has allowed me to go out and about on my bike, and yesterday I had a wonderful ride around the local lake. If you'd like to see pictures, have a look at my Instagram account. That's at P-Logic. Now today, I want to pose the question. In searching for the meaning of haiku, have we forgotten to look at what is not said? In not spending the time to read between the lines, perhaps we are abandoning excellent haiku and senryu to the wastelands and actually missing something of the real meaning and potentially ignoring the skill or the craft of the piece. I ask because many of you write to me saying that they think people aren't taking the time to think about what's written. Do we feel that people are looking for the quick hit, something obvious, and not having the patience to go deeper? So I'm going to talk a little bit about this topic today. I'm also delighted to welcome Peter Draper to the podcast, and I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a little while, and read you some of his work. And last but not least, the Renku concludes. But before I go on, I must say a big thank you to everyone who contributed to the last podcast, Erotica. It was a topic that required a certain bravery to write for, but you did it so brilliantly. Thank you so much. And thanks for all the feedback too. You know I always like to get your emails, to know that I'm not talking to myself, because I do enough of that as a parent. So, to my question of the day, in searching for the meaning of haiku, have we forgotten to look at what is not said? Billy Collins, in the introduction to haiku, The First Hundred Years, writes, Poets are likely to agree that at the heart of the haiku lies its revelatory effect on the reader. Where does this revelatory effect come from? Do readers look for it to hit them directly in the face, or... Do they spend the time reading, rereading, and turning the ideas, the words, and the images over in their mind? I wasn't sure how to explain this really, so I thought I'd just give you some examples which might illustrate better what I'm trying to say. Bass, picking bugs off the moon. I found this piece by Nick Vigilio in Haiku in English, The First Hundred Years. The picture is perhaps obvious. It's night, probably a full moon or very close to it, and a bass jumps from the water to eat insects. What is not said, but if you take the time to savour it, is that the bass is in silhouette against the moon, and the person watching is probably observing from low down on the water's edge to get the angle. So now we have a person in the verse, although we're not told about it. He proposes that the bugs are similar to the view of the craters and pockmarks on the moon. A metaphor, no less. Then, of course, there's the contrast of the singular and the multiple, the large and the small, and the viewpoint from the earth to the moon. So much craft involved in this small work. Daybreak. A white fish. Whiteness one inch. This one by Bashu, translated by David Landis Barnhill. On first reading I thought, OK, it's a white fish and it's small, only an inch. I admired the vastness of the dawn and then how Bashu had taken us from the huge expanse of sky to focus in on the detail of the fish and its tiny piece of whiteness. I saw the sun coming up and I wondered where the little fish was. Then I continued to think it through, Does the one inch refer to the fish or the lightness in the sky? It could be both. And so the poem was rounded out for me. And with each thought process, the enjoyment of the piece increased. 
And again, there is the person observing. Where is Basho? In the Quiet House, a Fridge by Frank Dulligan in Presence In just two lines, Frank has set up the picture for us. The house is quiet, empty except for the fixtures and fittings, and of course, the observer, who isn't mentioned. You're not told that the fridge is humming, but you know it instinctively, don't you? You don't have to be told. And then he gives you the contradiction of the quietness and the hum of the fridge. And this discrepancy creates humour in the piece, don't you think? Martin Lucas, in his analysis of this two-liner, says the following. Our expectations of a third line, perhaps describing the noise of the fridge, are defeated, and we are left with an empty space to fill in with our own memory of that familiar hum. An owl's moon watering the black between the stars. By Alan Summers, in Leaf Fall, issue 1.1. I'm lucky enough to be able to count Alan as a haiku friend and I asked him to analyse this piece for me and this is what he said. The full moon, in fact the fullest moon, are iconic around the world and owls are famously iconic thanks to storytelling from the likes of Disney and Jane Yolen and their full moons. And looking for owls or owling just goes together with the moon. Owling is often a pursuit on a cold winter's night. The first line suggests winter, perhaps January, February, in the Northern Hemisphere. Now the second line is mysterious, although suggesting night. And why again? Because we often think of owls as the symbol of night, or the extremely early morning, or the night before real day. In one way, this three-line haiku is saying night, night, night but quietly and firmly. There's black between stars to our naked eye, and the watering effect is, or could be, the reflection of the great black night across a body of water. Stream, river, lake. The moon famously ripples the water by effect, and also the ripples ripple the moon's reflection. It's a ripple in time, as time is frozen, as the owl flies overhead, or swoops down on its prey. The triple O effect in the first line captures the O in owl and the O in moon, and also the O of both iconic images, backlighting each other. The second line has a regular verb but used in a less regular relationship where everything is upside down and different senses. Not only is the question which way is up, but what element is really what it is, and how our senses can often switch at night away from the bright lights of home or partying in the city. And the last line is also, aren't we as a race of people and as a planet or part of a planet between stars or between star systems? I'm so glad I asked Alan for his thoughts. Bearing in mind what he's told me, I derive more and more pleasure from reading the verse time and time again. Now, let's learn a little bit about a poet new to the podcast, Peter Draper. He lives in the East Riding of Yorkshire in the UK, in a village called South Cave. It's a village I'm familiar with because my sister-in-law had her wedding reception there. Now, Peter's a very busy man. He works at the University of Hull as a professor of nursing and a leader of the Teaching Excellence Academy. He's also a part-time priest. And if that didn't keep him busy enough, he writes poetry and has become interested in haiku under the influence of one of our regular contributors, Roger Watson. And he absolutely loves archery. Archery, he says, is not unlike haiku. It's meditative and requires intellectual detachment and watchful awareness and combines stillness, precision and explosive power. He has a couple of tips for us. When you have one of those moments, write it down. Once it's written down, you can come back to it at any time. And you know, before I started this podcast, I spent a wee while trying to remember a moment that came to me in the middle of the night. 
with absolutely no success. So, I have to agree with Peter. Write it down. He also recommends getting feedback. And that, my friends, is where you come in. Keep the feedback coming. It helps me to learn. With regard to the two pieces we're going to hear, Peter says, I often find myself awake at 3am, and nowadays I occupy my mind with haiku as I listen to whatever sounds are out there. Perhaps that's why the haiku you've picked have a night theme. Our village bell rings on the hour throughout the night, but I assume that no one can hear it because they're asleep. And that got me thinking, what is that bell measuring, if not time? So what has Peter been thinking during the wee small hours? Let's hear. Still dark between midnight and birdsong. Unheard, the village bell measures darkness. Now, if you'd like to read more from Peter, I'll put his blog on the show notes. I'm pleased, honoured and just a little bit sad to bring you our Renku, all 22 verses of it. It was our first go at writing together. Coming as we do from all around the world and with so many cultural differences, I think the Renku is a marvel. I've certainly learned a great deal by doing it. Thank you so much to Giddy Nielsen Sweep, Robert Horobin, Shane M. Pruitt, Dick Bailey, Joan Barrett, Ricky Rivers Jr., Veronica Hoskin, Andy Sire, and Miniko Takahashi for writing with me. Big hugs to all of you. It wasn't easy, was it? You can read it in its entirety on the Poetry P website, but here it is. Cold sun, ageing reflections on orange snowflake. The world turns a half-frozen ball. Over the hill, now I look forward to the sunset. In the valley, footprints in the dew. Water lilies floating among the stars, twin moons. A sedentary cat stirs the darkness. Outside the window, a bird sings to itself, catnap. Silent dawn, eagle soars overhead. Cumulonimbus dominate the afternoon sky, Thor's warriors. Spotted mare, nickering, the hiss of rain on warm stone. Human hordes riding white horses, Neptune's rage. Galloping calamity, a hard misty place called home. Thick fog on the yellow brick road, the lion cries. Coyotes howl under the moonlight. Autumn dusk, feral dogs sight the hare. Sudden dust cloud thwarts the predator's ambitions. Sombre atmosphere finding perspective in the lilies. Feeling beneath the feet the fatigue of the bulbs. Yet again, next season, resurrection, a cycle of all lives. Sons and daughters hunting eggs in Grandma's garden. On the river's edge, a wild duck with chicks, rustling reeds. Deep in the down, the future slumbers. And so it ends, both the Renku and today's podcast. But before we leave the Renku, I'd like to ask you to think of a title for it. Send me an email and I'll choose one. I think we'll do it again. And so, if you'd like to write an opening verse for the next Renku, send it to me via email and we'll start all over again. The next podcast is one in which you do all the writing. The topic is trees and you have until the 8th of July to submit. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Please send your submissions by email or I might not see them. Thank you to all the Renku poets to Peter for his insight into his life and his work, and to Alan for his poetic analysis. I'm putting together themes for season three. If you have a burning desire to write or to encourage others to write on a certain topic, let me know. 
I have a few free topic spots at the moment. And don't forget to have a look at the show notes for all the links from today's podcast. Just give me a day or so to get them up. A huge thank you for joining me this time. And I hope you'll come back next time when we're talking trees. Will it be as popular as the Erotica podcast? I do hope so. Bye for now and keep writing. Don't forget, if there's something missing from the show notes or something wrong, just email me and I'll fix it. Ciao.